my approach to doing things is, like I said, preventionary. Um, and this is really where the nutritionists come in and looking at prepartum diets. Um, farms do this very differently. Um, and it's not a one size fits all approach. You have to take into consideration management strategies, um, what you can get your workers to do, um, what the cost benefit ratios are. Um, but we do have several things available to us now that we can use from low potassium diets, um, to, uh, calcium binders, kind of the, I mean, calcium binders, we can talk more about that, <laughs> potentially phosphorus binders, um, in the prepartum ration, which, um, also, uh, appears to work quite well. Um, and then the tried and true DCAT, which works extremely well, but does have some management, um, input that needs to happen in order to keep it working. Hello, everyone. This is Luis Ferreira with the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. And today we will be discussing everything about hypocalcemia. And to join us and explain a lot about this topic, we have Dr. Laura Hernandez from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. But before we get into this very important topic, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you for having me, Luis. It's a really great opportunity to talk about my work. Um, I've been here now for 14 years, surprisingly. <laughs> um, and I did my PhD at the University of Arizona with um, Bob Collier. And um, I did a postdoc for three years at the University of Cincinnati, but have been here since then looking at calcium and uh, maternal health. Um, and that's kind of what's led me down this path. So been doing a lot of really intensive studies, but it has led us to really big questions that I think are translational for um, the field. So hopefully I can answer your questions and provide um, the producers and the nutritionists with some ideas to think about. Looking to maximize your herd's potential? Elevate performance with Kemen's cutting edge encapsulation technologies, including rumen protected choline, methionine, and lysine. Kemen's advanced choline and amino acid technologies ensure precise nutrient delivery, boosting milk yield and enhancing herd health. Trust Kemen, the experts in encapsulation, to take your herd to the next level. Learn more today at kemen.com forward slash dairy. So obviously, hypocalcemia is a topic that we discuss as scientists, nutritionists, veterinarians, and so on for many, many years, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously, the way people look at hypocalcemia probably change a little bit over the years. So, so tell us, what would be the best way to manage cows and prevent delayed and persistent hypocalcemia? And more important, what are those? Great question. Um, first of all, I would say I'm all about being an advocate for prevention. Um, I think whatever we can do to prevent these outcomes are what's best for the cow and for her next lactation and for the calf, to be quite honest. Um, so whatever we can do to prevent and, of course, treat if necessary. But delayed hypocalcemia is when you have a normal blood calcium concentration um, within the first two days postpartum. But then at four days postpartum and after that, you would have what would be classified as clinical or subclinical hypocalcemia. So the onset would be later um, rather than the beginning. And in that period, you have issues because the cow can't quite homeostatically reset herself. As far as persistent goes, this is what you would see with a low blood calcium subclinical um, at day one, two postpartum, but then also continue to be subclinical or clinical four days postpartum. So you're getting too low blood calciums for an extended period of time. And obviously, when you have low blood calcium concentrations, a whole host of things can happen. And those are cows that likely will have more disease, DAs, retained placentas, um, et cetera, uh, ketosis. Um, and they'll also have collectively lower milk production um, over the course of their lactation and are more likely to leave the herd. Um, so my approach to doing things is, like I said, preventionary. Um, and this is really where the nutritionists come in and looking at prepartum diets. Um, farms do this very differently. Um, and it's not a one size fits all approach. You have to take into consideration management strategies. 
um, what you can get your workers to do, um, what the cost benefit ratios are. Um, but we do have several things available to us now that we can use from low potassium diets um, to uh, calcium binders, kind of the, I mean, calcium binders, we can talk more about that, <laughs> potentially phosphorus binders um, in the prepartum ration, which um, also uh, appears to work quite well. Um, and then the tried and true DCAT, which works extremely well, but does have some management um, input that needs to happen in order to keep it working. So um, that's my suggestion anyway. No, absolutely. I highly agree with you. Prevention is the best option because at the end of the day, you don't want to have those cows that will have hypocalcemia. And more importantly, right, we're going to have all the drops in milk production and cooling rates, as you describe. And probably this is a loss, a huge loss scenario for, for any farms. Uh, continue with these different types of hypocalcemia. Mm -hmm. uh, a new topic, at least new to me, but uh, that I see people discussing a lot is this transient hypocalcemia. How does that work and how does that impact health compared to some of the other scenarios that you describe? For sure. Um, so I'll, I'll try to keep it simple, um, but calcium status is a hormone driven process. Like a lot of these things are in this transition from pregnancy to lactation. And the way you deal with calcium is through what is a classical negative feedback loop. Um, and what does that mean? you have to have a decrease in a hormone to trigger a biological response. And that's how calcium works. So if we do too much with keeping calcium up, sometimes the cow can't reset herself and have that trigger of negative feedback so she can mobilize calcium or absorb more calcium or retain more calcium for herself and for the milk production. And so this transient hypocalcemia in some shape or form is required to have a really good negative feedback response. Sometimes that means the cow is subclinical. Sometimes it just means she decreases from a prepartum calcium. And of course, unless you're sampling tons, you wouldn't know exactly what that looks like, but um, it's really quite important. And so what we've been looking at, um, along with Jess McCart's lab at Cornell, um, from a very epidemiological perspective, is this what we call transient. And the way she's classified this is you get to 24 hours post postpartum, um, sometimes 48, but then you would have what would be a subclinical decrease in blood calcium. So you'd be in that subclinical level, but by day four, you're normal. And what she's found in her production data is that indeed these cows make more milk, they have less disease, and they often make more milk than the cows that are never subclinical or the normal calcemic um, status at day one and day four postpartum. And I think, at least I hypothesize that the reason this is, is because they're better at activating the hormones that allow them to absorb calcium more efficiently in the gut. Um, and maintain it and not excrete it as much into the urine and also mobilize the bone tissue that happens um, in every lactating animal to support milk production. Um, and so the way she's been classifying cows really like resonated with a lot of the data that we were seeing in our really intense physiological studies. Um, and so it appears at least that you really need to trigger this response to have really good production and really good health. So it's, it's, it's like you're saying that there is a good hypocalcemia then. So said that, right? Let's assume this is true for a moment. Yeah. Uh, the next giant leap in dairy profitability is here. Introducing AffiCollar feed efficiency service from AffiMilk, the first sensor to accurately measure individual cow dry matter intake. Combined individual feed consumption with milk production data to get profitability insights never before available. Hear from producers who are using it to make a big impact on profitability and sustainability at affymilk.com. That's A-F-I-M-I-L-K dot com. So you mentioned a lot of different strategies, right, including DCAT diets and uh, calcium binders, maybe phosphorus binders. Is there any strategy that helps to have more cows in this particular state or or, or is something that we didn't figure out yet how to, to have cows uh, reaching this point so, so we can have a better health herd? Great question. 
Um, I don't think we know fully whether like one dietary strategy does it better than others. Um, we did recently publish a paper, but we only had 40 cows per treatment. Um, and I'm not sure that's enough to say like this dietary strategy does it better than the other dietary strategy. And I certainly know that no company is going to let us compare exactly, you know, one product versus the other and to do a big enough study to really get at these health outcomes. Um, and our study, when we were comparing um, a calcium binding product, which actually appears to be much more of a phosphorus binding product, um, the calcium status was much higher already prepartum than the DCAD. Um, the DCAD became subclinical day one postpartum, and the, the calcium and the um, and the binding study did not, but it did decrease from where it was prepartum. And so we would really have to do a larger study to get at like, what's the production, the true production response? What is the true health response? But I think the big take home from that is that not all these dietary strategies are equal in what they do. And we really, really should make a good attempt to understand that because, um, you know, when a producer is making decisions, like, do I need to call these cows? Is what I'm paying for this product the right thing? Like, can I actually make it work in my pre-fresh um, system? Because they, they are fed for different periods of time and for different lengths of time. And as you know, you're out on farms much more than I am. Every producer has a different setup in their pre-fresh um, pens. And so I think you have to like take that all into consideration on what's um, coming out the other side and the economics and the long-term health. But the goal would be to keep cows in the herd longer, from my opinion, and also to keep them healthier and producing, you know, at a maximal level. And so I think we're just starting to scratch at the surface of that. I don't think anyone really knew that this calcium binder was like really more of a phosphorus binder until we did our study. Um, and phosphorus is like a lost mineral from what I can tell in the literature. Um, no one's been really doing much with that until recently. And so I think there's some opportunity to understand that as well and how that impacts like what's coming out on the backside of the cow too from a manure and urine prospect. Absolutely. All great insights. I'm sure that people will take uh, a lot of those into consideration when determining what is best uh, for the herds they work with for their own farms. Uh, so thanks again, Laura, for joining us today. And thank you at home uh, for joining us uh, for this podcast. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you.